So you've heard from six army soldiers and a marine. You've heard from an infantryman, a tanker, Actually, two scout. scouts, forward observer, a trainer, civil affairs, team member, and a medic. According to international law, the rules of engagement are laws that limit the use of force. Unnecessarily broad or expansive rules of engagement are tacit orders to kill and destroy. Broad rules of engagement are a natural result of any occupation. When, one time they uh, said that uh, to fire on all taxi cabs because the enemy was using them for, for transportation. And uh, in, in Iraq, any car can be a taxi cab. You just paint it white and orange, and there you have it. I mean, myself, I never really considered myself a racist person, but everything was, was Haji this, Haji that, Haji smokes, Haji burger, Haji house, Haji clothes, Haji rag. Haji's the same as honky. And they said, hey, Vigis, you know, you want your picture with this guy? And I said, no. But no, not in the context of that's really messed up because it's just wrong on an ethical basis. But I said no because it wasn't my kill. You shouldn't take trophies for things you didn't kill. For the infantrymen, scouts, and tankers of C Troop, 1st Squadron, 1st United States Cavalry Regiment, there are a few words which can express my admiration. I can merely say that I love them with all of my heart and that I would never have made it home alive without such a worthy and courageous host at my side. These were men who risked everything for a cause which they believed was just and true. They left behind them their families, their friends, and their lives. And in fact, they endured the unendurable. They did this not for greed or jealousy or hatred, but for the sake of love. And for that, they are beyond judgment. And I am no judge, and I have not come here to pass judgment either on my fellow soldiers or the officers who once commanded us in war. I'm simply here today to pass judgment on war itself. We've all heard of celebratory fire being mistaken for hostile fire, and this is a textbook case of that. Uh, old grandpa or whoever was on top of the roof cutting loose with his rifle because he was so happy that his daughter was getting married. Uh, meanwhile, this 82nd patrol in his front yard gets ambushed from across the road, and they return fire in both directions. And just to be brief on this, they, they hit three people inside the wedding party. Uh, one of them was an adult man uh, who was you know, slightly wounded. Another young girl, maybe 10, was slightly wounded. Um, but what really got me was uh, there was another girl who was maybe six or seven, and she was dead. And uh, basically they told us to continue mission. They said, Charlie Mike, and that's military jargon for continued mission. And uh, so we, we, were, we didn't want to be there anymore. Uh, we just hopped up in our Humvees and rode out. In all this chaos, everyone's screaming uh, we, and trying to find another way to get in. We go through the front door. Uh, and then we start hearing a lady screaming. Go! 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 We destroy this lady's house and we find nothing. We've, we've scared her to death and her children and come out, find out at the end of the video, you'll even hear, uh, we were off by a number. It was the house across the street. Is this one of it? Oh, shit. This woman saying that, oh, you was here, right? Yeah. What did what she say? I, I didn't hear. The guy lives across the street. Oh, no. What's, go, let's go across the street. We got time. You know, my platoon was what's called weapons-free on 25 millimeter, and I mean, you know, the longer you go in Iraq, uh, the more friends you take, the angrier you get, the more resentful you get at the people, the more frustrated you get that you can't find the, the person who just killed your friends. Um, I mean, you start, you start losing... Uh, start losing focus, I guess, on the missions. Things don't, you know, it's not so much about the mission anymore. It's about, you know, doing what you have to do to make sure you don't have to stand in another formation and listen to Amazing Grace played in bagpipes one more time. 
like the 25 millimeter chain gun, which is the armament on a Bradley, is a uh, quite a an effective weapon, an efficient weapon. Uh, it fires uh, automatically, and every round is like a hand grenade traveling thousands of feet per second. I mean, the civilians involved weren't necessarily, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to avoid that kind of fire. It's kind of hard to avoid not being on the battlefield in Iraq. Uh, it's an occupation, and, and it's in... You know, you're, you're walking around people's neighborhoods, people's homes. I uh, spent about three years as a drill sergeant. And then I uh, decided I was going to uh, volunteer to go to Iraq and serve as an advisor to the Iraqi army. Whether it is uh, tomorrow or in 100 years, I think that the Iraqis, as soon as we uh, uh, leave that country, are going to handle things the way that they're going to handle them. Um, and the way they handle things, that's just the way things are going to pan out. It's their, cult it's, it's their culture. It's their country. Uh, we're, you know, allegedly giving them democracy, so let's give it to them. And I think it's criminal to put such patriotic Americans who have sworn a, an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America in a situation where their morals are at odds with their survival instincts. This is me posing on the hood of that car. Um, and as was alluded to earlier, it felt funny because, not because what we were doing was morally wrong, but because I wasn't the one that killed this guy. And there was a group of us Marines that, that all took turns taking pictures and, and posing like this. And at the first Winter Soldier in 1971, one of the testifiers showed a similar picture and said, don't ever let your government do this to you. And still, our government is doing this to patriotic young men and women of this country who have volunteered their lives in the service of this country and putting them in a situation where this kind of thing is normal. And I got a, a random call on, on my field phone at the checkpoint saying, you need to take one Marine and get up to the road and stop any black opal that comes your way. <laughs> and all I could say was, what's an opal? <laughs> and and so that the president himself can gush on and on about how much he cares about the Iraqi people while continuing a policy that is decimating their country. And we care so that the American people don't have to. So that these things can go on in the name, in our names. But as was made clear to me, because I took some pictures in Iraq that uh, that were used in propaganda magazines that were put out to the Iraqi people to try to convince them that we were actually doing them a lot of good. And, you know, on a small local scale, we were in civil affairs, and I was really proud of some of the work that we did in, in those respects. But it was clear the, the futility of that in the bigger picture, that a country that desperately needs rule of law more than anything will never get it with a foreign military imposing martial law. And, you know, we had our functioning democracy in America without electricity for quite a few years, and we did all right. And to say that we can't leave until certain standards of living are met is absurd. But as soon as you choose looking good over doing right, you will fail miserably at both. A 50 meter bubble around our trucks at all times, whether we're driving down the road or whether we're stationary. And if anything comes in that 50 meter bubble, we're to get it out immediately. If it doesn't want to move, we use what are called levels of aggression. Your first option is to try to push it out by using hand signals, hand and arm signals. Your next option is to fire a warning shot into the ground. And from there on, you walk bullets up the car. And your last option is to shoot the person driving the car. But as time went on and the absurdity of war sat in, they started taking things too far. Individuals from my unit indiscriminately and unnecessarily opened fire on innocent civilians as they're driving down the road on their own streets. He came running to, to me with this guy and laid him at my feet. I looked down at him, and the guy was missing from here to here of his arm, and his forearm was only held on by a small flap of skin. The bones were protruding. I noticed that his entire left butt cheek was missing, and it was bleeding profu profusely, and it was pooling blood. Every couple of days, I will get a flash of red color in my mind's eye, and it won't have any shape, no form, just a flash of red. And every time I associate it with that instant. That's war. But instead of a soldier 
I'm a soldier now, you know? I've, I've switched it around. I like to just give this little poem here now. A soldier has put down their rifles and has picked up their souls. Instead of bullets, a soldier has their words. Instead of dogma, a soldier listens to their heart. Instead of secret codes, a soldier reflects their feelings and their thoughts. Instead of stealing land, a soldier expands the intellect. Instead of taking aim, a soldier takes reason. Instead of building fortifications that divide, a soldier grows with unity for all humankind. This is my battle buddy, Staff Sergeant Christopher Kelly, call sign Keister. He was a patriot, a great friend, a superb mentor, and an exemplary leader of Marines.